over the past year now, I've been running a lot of Rust, especially backend applications. And one of the questions that came up with one of my friends was, can you still get SQL injection in Rust? And this is actually a really fantastic question that I wanted to answer myself with a bit of research. I use a framework called SQLX, which is a fantastic framework. And I wanted to see if I could cause SQL injection or is it secure by default? And I think by the end of this research, you'll hopefully know which is which. And I want to know in the comments section whether this code on screen right now is secure or not, or if there is any bugs, please let me know. So let's start our research by creating a new Rust project, in my case, SQLX texting. You can use something like Cargo in it or Cargo Generate to generate all of the files for you. In my case, this will create me a source um, main.rs file that would do most of our testing in today. Uh, Cargo.toml to do actually most of our maintaining of all of our dependencies and things like this and then the only other file i added just before this testing was a docker compose file which we'll get to later so let's first start off by installing all the dependencies we need so let's go ahead and edit our cargo.toml file and we're going to add some dependency changes in here so in our case we're going to add a couple of things the first of all being tokyo so for those who aren't familiar it's an asynchronous runtime for rust really fantastic um, highly recommend take a look at it and one of the things that we are adding is actually the features of full so that's the only thing that we need to add as an extra feature the second thing that we're going to do is we're going to add anyhow so it's a great framework for handling errors a little bit better in rust for us and then the second and the main part of our testing will be on a library called sql x this is a great framework that i've been using for a while now and we're going to add some features as well to this so this really allows us to install our SQLX library, which is the one we're going to be testing. We're going to add a couple of features. So to add support for the Tokyo runtime, we're going to just add the runtime-tokyo-rust-ls or rust-tls. And then we're going to add Postgres. So that's the database we'll be using to test out our stuff today. And then some of the offline mode as well. This is more for offline and some of the query verification that we'll be doing later as well. So now we can go ahead and update these dependencies. So you can just save and quit, for example, and run a cargo uh, run, for example. This will download and compile all of our dependencies for us. And now we're finished compiling, we can now go ahead and start writing some of our Rust code. So let's now go and edit our main.rust file. So in my case, I'm going to be using NeoVim. And I'm going to update it to add in all the things that we need. So the first thing we want to do is add anyhow. So this is a fantastic framework for making it a lot easier to uh, handle errors in Rust and make it a little bit simpler. So the only change that we need to do to our main is here. We just want to say, yeah, we're going to use this. Um, and we want to return a blank here. So that's the first thing to do. The second thing to do is add Tokyo to our project. So this can be done by actually just adding a macro on our main function. So the Tokyo main function. And then we want to make our function async as well. Now we can start adding all the SQL X components we need. So the first thing we need is to actually add the SQL X library um, PG pool strut as well. So this allows us to create a pool for uh, Postgres connections. Then we can start writing some of the code. So the first thing we'll need is a connection string. In our case, I'm gonna just do add a type as well. And this, what we're gonna do is actually gonna be calling from the um, the standard library and looking from environment variable. Uh, in our case, we're gonna use one called database URL. Now, of course, this can return an option. So we're gonna use the anyhow magic to actually unwrap automatically our option. After this, now we want to actually create a pool so in our case this will be a postgres pool so we're going to use the pg struts and we're going to use the connection um, function with the connection string that we used in our case connection uh, this is actually a asynchronous function so we need to call await and it also returns a result so if the connection fails it's an error but in our case we're actually going to unwrap it and of course to get this actually compiling we need to add a reference here instead the next part is we want to add dynamic input to our application to simulate, for example, an Atrix or Rocket parameter coming into the application. So in our case, we're going to be creating a variable called input. This is going to be a string 
and it's going to be coming from our command line arguments in rust you can use the args here and in the case we want to get the last argument so whatever the last argument is provided and we're going to use unwrap or so we're going to be providing a standard string um for our input and maybe this could be the letter r and you'll see why later so let's now quickly go and add some quick boilerplate for, before we start writing our sql queries this is just creating a simple strap with the an id username and a handle and the biggest thing that we want to take a look at is that we need to use this derive sqlx from row in our application as well and now we can start building queries if we go over and take a look at the sqlx docs now you can see there's actually quite a few macros we could use in our case we actually want to take a look at both the query and the query as the biggest difference is that the query as allows you to actually output a specific type that you want and you don't have to do your own casting so for our example first of all we're going to try out this so now let's go back to our code and let's actually quickly add an example where maybe let's say we want to get a list of users so we're going to create a variable called user we're going to create a vector of as a result we want to actually come back with a list of all the users and then we're going to use the module uh, SQL X and use this query as and the, as I said earlier the only difference between query and query as is that you can do automatic type casting so in our case we're going to cast it to the user um, and then what we want to do is write a query string so in our case we're going to do select star uh, from not where that comes later from a table called users and we want to do something like where user name is equal to let's actually parameterize this for now so the secure variant of this and let's maybe add something like our input here for example now if you save this this will error out and the reason is because first of all you need to actually run a function called fetch all and provide it with that data pool that we just uh, created earlier so in our case there but even if you do this this is also still the wrong type you actually need to await this as well and make sure we unwrap it one of the things that really stood out to me about sqlx is this looks syntactically correct to me but then actually when you start looking into like what are the potential errors you can actually see the bottom error here is that actually there's no communication or there's like a connection refuse with the database and to me i was like when I first saw this was like, oh, okay, what do you mean? Do you need a running database to just do local testing? And this is actually one of the most powerful things about SQLx is that you can verify A, the syntax of your queries are correct, but also at compile time to verify that the transaction would be completely valid. So actually let's now go and create that database for us. So I mentioned earlier about the Docker compose file and let's actually go and quickly edit this. So we can take a look at this. This is just a Docker compose file. I'm setting up a Postgres database and an administrator just back in portal just to make things a little bit easier to manage. And then finally as well, I have this end file where I'm storing just the SQL and Postgres passwords as well. Um, of course, don't store this in your Git repository, but it's there anyway. And now what we can actually do is open up a new terminal and do a Docker compose uh, run dash D. So this will just spin up and as detached Docker container of both of these things and now if we go back here uh maybe quit and reopen and then we can go back to our rust code in this case and now if we do a run we can actually see now that that syntax error has gone but it turns out that there's actually a syntax error in our query itself and that's because of this question mark in sqlx you actually use the percentage one and then if you now do this you can see this is now valid Rust code and it's compiling. There is a warning, but that's because we are using that variable. A quick side note is that you can use SQL X in offline mode, which is actually when it creates this uh, JSON file that then actually just maps to a schema of your database. And it makes sure that, for example, you're syntactically correct as well. One thing that I will note that I found is really interesting is that when you do modify your query to be things like, let's say you modify it to a like, for example, that will be fine but if you do it leave it as an l and then compile it you can actually see that this is incorrect and if you look at the warning it will actually give you that it's near this l because of course it doesn't this is not valid sql which is really really powerful for developers but now let's start getting into more of the security parts of this
let's now revert our code and now actually do one last thing before we start doing some testing let's actually go through each of the users that we have so we do for each user in users and then let's just do a quick pretty print of this as well just so that we know for example that hey what users are actually being um, printed out and selected as part of our query statement now so now if we go back and actually run this so a cargo run for example this will compile and run our application we can see that this is not set so we need to set our database uh, url and then once we run this now you can see this is not printing anything we can start adding in different examples so let's say that we add the word geek measure for example and you can actually see this is actually a user inside the database so let's now go and trail the logs of our database to see what types of queries are being run and executed as well. So in Tmux, I'm going to create a separate window because there's going to be a large amount of logs. And I'm going to use docker compose logs dash F. So this will just follow the trail of the logs. And then I'm going to only look at the database container. So in this case, you can see here, there's a bunch of things where it started up the database. And right at the bottom here, we can see that there's a particular query run with a username um, and the parameter being passed in is geek measure. So if we run that again, we can actually see that this is now created too. Fantastic. So let's now try maybe a more SQL injection like payload. So let's run cargo run. Maybe we want to create a payload where we're doing something like uh, or one equals one, the standard kind of SQL injection payload. And of course, what we actually notice inside the database is this is being parameterized. So there's no way of manipulating that user input to actually cause SQL injection. Fantastic. So secure by default. Absolutely love it. Now, let's see if we can cause SQL injection accidentally by introducing it into our code. So in this case, let's try something. First of all, let's try something like format macro with maybe a, let's say, a format string and we want to provide it input for example and we're going to remove these things as well and let's see what happens when i compile it and of course what i'm seeing is that okay there's a compile error what is the compile error and if i take a look at this now what i can see is that it's expecting a string literal okay so it's actually detecting where i'm having maybe dynamic strings where maybe i can't maybe create a format string or something like that Okay, interesting. That's a really interesting way. And actually, this is something that we've seen in Python in 3.11, if I believe correctly, where actually they've introduced it so that it prevents this kind of thing as well. So type checking, in, uh, when you're running a type checker, it'll actually detect whether or not you're using dynamic strings. So let's try another way. Let's create a maybe a new thing called query. I'll call it here, for example. Um, we're going to create a format string. Uh, we're going to just yank this and replace this, what we have here, for example. And then let's create this. It's creating a string. Okay, that's perfect. Let's remove this and now just replace it with query. And let's do that again. And it's the exact same thing. It's expecting a string literal. So I, it literally cannot allow us to actually create a SQL query this way. And the awesome fact is that this is done all at compile time. So you can't even get this to a point where this is running in production as an insecure version as well. So let's revert our changes and have a look at what actually is happening under the hood. So let's go back to the docs and actually look at this source code for this query as macro. So let's have a quick look at the source code of the macro. And we can see here a couple of interesting things. One is that there's two expressions that there are conditional expressions. The first one being this strut out. So this must be the type that's being uh, added into our macro and then the query which is this expression here and the second one is pretty much the exact same but you can have a list of different arguments as well and then at build time this is getting expanded as well so the interesting thing here is that both of the branches inside this macro rule actually call the exact same crate called sqlx macros and then it's actually calling another macro inside of this um, called expand query this is actually a completely separate crate called SQLX macros that way we can actually go into the expand query and let's go and take a look at the source code. We can actually see here that this is actually a function that's taking a stream of tokens. So this is the AST tokens at build time. And then it's doing some more expanding other running of different functions and match functions, and then maybe returning some compile errors, etc. And this is actually where Rust can get really complicated using macros.
if we now jump over to GitHub for a bit better code search, well, let's take a look at this first line that we see here. So sin is a library for, for parsing and tokenizing string inputs. But the interesting piece is this second part here, this query macro input. If we now navigate to this, so go to this implementation of parser, parse here, and we can see here that actually there's this function that is being called that needs to return a sin result and it parses a stream of tokens. And what you can actually see is farther down, you can see this one line here that pretty much to me shows cases that actually this needs to be um, a list of string literals and then it will build up a query of string literals and then that it becomes your query string. But if it's not, because of this question mark here, the error, if this does occur, if there's a parsing error, so if you're using a non-literal string, for example, it should error up and bubble up and tell you as an inducer that, hey, you need to use a string literal. I say a list of string literals, but this is actually because if you concatenate two literal strings, so hard-coded one string, hard-coded another string, this is completely fine. But if you dynamically supply a string, then that's where the problem can occur. And the last question you might have is, where does this key come from that's equal to source? How can I make sure that this is the clause that is actually run? And it actually, in fact, comes from the macro itself that we first off started off with, where actually the query is equal to the source when this expand query macro is run. Another thing you can do is actually expand the macros in something like NeoVim to see exactly what is the output of the compiler when the macro is expanded. In my case, I can use leader GE. And what this will actually do is open up a panel that if I open up, you can see actually this is what is actually being produced at compile time as the end result of that macro expansion. We can see actually halfway down that our select query is present in the expanded macro and it's also being passed into this with query function. So now we've done the investigation to actually see what these query macros do. Is there a way that we can still cause SQL injection inside SQLX? Turns out the answer is yes. Where a lot of the issues occur with SQLX when it comes to SQL injection issues is actually to do with the functions that have similar names to the macros that we saw earlier. So for example, let's take a look at this query as function. So now let's go ahead and actually create an example of this. So I'm gonna quickly just take a yank of this because it's gonna be very similar to this, but I'm also gonna comment this out because we don't need it for now. And of course this won't compile correctly, but what we're going to do is we're going to change a couple of things. One is we're going to use the function. So you can see the function signature here. Um, there's only a small difference here is instead of the syntax here where we had to use that use there, we have to use a syntax called TurboFish syntax in this case. And I'm going to just set as like we want it as the user as a return. And we're going to do something similar to what we did before. But instead of a string here, to make a secure version of this, you can you need to actually supply a bind function here. So if you save this now, it should all be compiling fine. And then if you run this now with just Geek Masher, you take a few seconds for it to compile, you're getting the same results. So now let's go and see if we can make this vulnerable. So let's take an example here where we're using the same of this, but we want to use a format string instead. So what we can actually do is use the format macro as we did earlier. And we're going to replace it with something that looks a lot like this with an input. Um, and then we're going to remove this. Now this shouldn't work because you need this to eat, you need this to be an actual string. Um, so you can just do something like that or an as string uh, on, on this format string. And now if we compile it, it should work the exact same functionality as before, but with one key difference. If you now run the previous attack, so for example, all one equals one, for example, you'll actually get this where it's unquoted. And if we go back to the database logs, you can actually see where this actual statement is being created here. And now it actually has all this information in here. So let's now go back and maybe fix up our payload. So in our case, maybe we want to add a quick comment on the end there. And now we can see we're getting all of the results inside the database. Because if you go back to our database, logs you can actually see here now is that we're pretty much writing a query that says select username where it's equal to nothing or one equals one and one equals one will always execute and then this dash dash is just for commenting out the rest of the card so it's at least valid sql 
This also means that you can dynamically create your queries in other parts of the code. So let's take the example where we replace this format string with a variable. So let's just call this query and it's going to return a string. What we can do is just remove that so it's an actual string. Of course, this doesn't work anymore, but what we can do is just create query here. And of course, this is the incorrect type. So let's just quickly do that. And now if we run the exact same again, you can see that we've got the exact same issue. So now if you start building your query strings dynamically using maybe concatenation as well as format strings, that's when you'll start to see all of these SQL injection problems still occur in language like Rust. So going back to our non-vulnerable code now, I wanted to test out how we can actually do this also including wildcards. And it actually is also straightforward where you can create maybe a variable called, I'm just going to call it wild, which is going to be a string. I'm going to use a format string as well. And I'm going to also use input like this. And I'm going to add these wildcard symbols as well so that um, we can dynamically select the inputs that we want securely. And then all we need to do is now replace this with wild, save this, and then rerun the exact same as what we did before. So we can look for Geek Masher, for example. And of course, we need to actually change our statement to be a like clause. And now when we run it, we can see now that it correctly pulls out Geek Masher. But with the added value that if you add in things like a single letter or multiple letters, you'd be able to detect and correctly search the database for the correct variables. So as a conclusion, SQL X is a fantastic framework for interacting with databases. You can still cause SQL injection, but the majority of the time you should be safe. But honestly, using the macros is the best thing to do and just pretty much making sure that you always use those macros. They are secure by default. They have so many features that come out of the box that go along with them that I explained earlier. It's just a win-win overall. This research is all on GitHub under my username, so please go and take a look and give it a good star. And yes, I think Bobby is still alive and well in Rustland. And I really appreciate you all watching this to the end. Thank you. Please like and subscribe.